In the US, about 3,000 stocks pay dividends. Of those, only 53 pay monthly dividends according to SureDividend.com. However, many of them are risky and should be avoided. In this video, I'm gonna share the four best monthly dividend stocks with high dividend yields as high as 7.7%. Of the 53 monthly dividend stocks out there, I consider these to be the safest relative to their peers, but you should always do your own research before making any investment decisions. Some of these businesses are very complex and you should always do your own due diligence before investing in them. Real quick though, there's one company that I decide to exclude from consideration and that is Realty Income, which is arguably the most well-known monthly dividend stock out there. And there's two primary reasons. First, I really like Realty Income and I personally own it myself. And basically it's the go-to monthly dividend stock that most investors would consider first. And so for this video, I want to focus on companies that don't get as much attention. Second, I want to find monthly dividend stocks with higher dividend yields than realty income. In my opinion, realty income is very safe, but you do pay a premium for that quality and that translates into a lower yield compared to others. So I want to find stocks with higher dividend yields with companies behind them that are as close to in quality as realty income. The first company on the list is Stag Industrial, ticker symbol Stag. This is an equity REIT or a real estate investment trust that acquires and operates industrial properties in the US. Think massive warehouses, vital distribution centers, light manufacturing facilities, properties that are essential for many sectors of the economy in locations all across the country. The company's portfolio is exposed to more than 45 industries across more than 60 geographic markets. So exactly how big of a portfolio are we talking about? At its IPO in April 2011, it owned just 93 properties covering 14 million square feet. Now, as of the end of 2020, nearly 10 years later, it owns 492 properties and has septupled to 98 million square feet, which is a remarkable growth rate, and it isn't likely to slow down because consider the growth of e-commerce. Less than 10 years ago, online sales were only made up 5.4% of retail sales and has since increased to 14.3% as of 2020. But more importantly for Stag, retail inventory to sales has crumbled due to the pandemic and it may never go back to normal. COVID may have permanently transformed the retail supply chain, driving up secular demand for the warehouses and distribution properties Stag operates. Already 40% of its portfolio is involved in e-commerce activity and that is certainly going to grow. But that concentration is not obvious when you take a look at its top 10 tenants by annualized base rent or ABR. Amazon only makes up 3.8%, which is surprisingly low but reassuring. FedEx makes up 1%, American Tire makes up 0.9%, Penguin Random House, a publishing giant, makes up another 0.9%. Then you have Ford and Costco that round out the top 10. The top 10 tenants make up only 12.3%. The top 20 make up less than 20%. So yeah, the low concentration of its tenant base and wide diversification of industry minimizes the risk of catastrophic revenue loss. And it speaks to how vital these properties are for many companies. So much so that if you take a look at Stack's revenue, it increased 19% between 2019 to 2020. Operating income jumped a staggering 28%. Nothing in this company's performance gives me any hint that there was a global pandemic, that the country went into a recession, that the S&P 500 dropped 34%, that unemployment rose to a record 14.7%, and nearly 16 million people were out of work. Whether I look at it annually or quarterly, it doesn't make a difference. It consistently beat analyst estimates over the last four quarters. In fact, the company collected 99.6% of its base rent during the pandemic year. A sample of industrial REITs shows the sector maintaining a 96% collection rate during the depth of the COVID recession, which is in stark contrast to lower than 50% for some retail REITs during the same time period. All of this goes to show how resilient Stag's business model is. Its tenants depend on its properties because the assets are so critical to their operations. Right now, Stag pays a dividend of 4.5% that is slightly lower than its four-year average. It has grown its dividend for only seven consecutive years, but considering it has only been publicly trading since 2011, that shouldn't be a red flag. In terms of dividend safety, the payout ratio based on cash flow or FFO is around 80%, which is reasonable for REITs, since they are legally required to pay out 90% of their net income to shareholders. And it is comparable to realty income 
income, which currently stands at 83% based on cash flow. In terms of dividend growth, the company is projecting FFO of between $1.94 to $2 per share for 2021. It had FFO of $1.89 per share for 2020, which comes out to an average of 4.2% growth expected for the coming year. In comparison, FFO increased 2.7% between 2019 to 2020. So that is a good sign that management is confident that growth will pick up this year, which should translate into a higher dividend. Stag has rewarded its investors with not just a consistent income, but growth by positioning itself as a leading industrial REIT. Based on the cumulative total returns of the stock, it has done comparable to the S&P 500 between 2014 through 2019, and it had 22% higher returns over the same time period compared to the broader MSCI US REIT index, which represents the market cap weight average performance of 137 REITs. Over the long term, the company expects the industrial market opportunity to be more than $1 trillion in size. Currently, Stag only makes up 0.5% of that target market, which which means there's a lot of growth potential for the company. If you're interested in Stag or any of the next monthly dividend stocks, invest on Webull and get two free stocks worth up to $1,850 just by opening an account and depositing $100. Webull is an online trading platform that is commission-free, no minimum deposits, there's no cost to use a basic service. So you get free money just by signing up and making a deposit. So check it out by using the link in the description and by doing so, you also help support this channel, so thank you. The next company is Main Street Capital, ticker symbol Maine. Maine is a business development company or BDC. If you're not familiar with what these are, at a high level they are a special type of company created by Congress in the 1980s to make it easier for medium-sized businesses to get access to capital. Businesses in this size category are considered to be what is called middle market and there are an estimated to be 200,000 of them in the US that contribute around 33% to the nation's GDP and employ about 30 million people so it's a big segment of the economy. They typically generate between $10 million to $1 billion in revenue and this is where these businesses have a problem. Because of their size, they face challenges in accessing capital when they are looking to improve or grow their business. Since the 2008-2009 financial crisis, banks face greater regulatory and compliance scrutiny and so they've generally shied away from lending to any company that is perceived as risky. So banks tend to lend only to the larger upper market companies with quality balance sheets and years of stable growth. Growth. On the other hand, middle market companies are too big for angel investors or venture capital firms. So BDCs fill an important gap by providing access to capital for these medium-sized companies, mainly through loans or by taking an equity stake in them. Now, what makes these companies special is somewhat similar to REITs and MLPs in that they don't pay corporate taxes as long as they distribute 90% of their income in the form of dividends. This is why BDCs like Main Street tend to have higher dividend yields compared to a typical publicly traded company and even better, BDCs that perform well often pay out special dividends on top of their regular dividends because they make so much money and they don't want to go under the 90% threshold. And you can see for Maine, the frequency of these special dividends in this chart on a quarterly basis. These peaks aren't dividend cuts, but dividends above and beyond what is regularly paid out. But like REITs, BDCs are structured as pass-through entities, so a big portion of the dividends are going to be unqualified ordinary income taxed at a higher rates than qualified qualified dividends. However, this can vary substantially between BDCs and year over year. So investing in BDCs through a tax advantage account like an IRA or a 401k might be a good idea to avoid the headache at tax time. Now they have to meet other requirements in order to maintain their special status, such as holding at least 70% of their assets in private US companies and having a maximum debt to equity leverage limit of two to one. Unlike REITs and MLPs though, there aren't as many BDCs out there. As of this recording, there are 44 publicly traded BDCs DCs. And Main Street happens to be the seventh largest by net assets and fifth largest by market cap. It has $4.3 billion in capital under management with $3.3 billion managed internally and $1 billion as an investment advisor to outside parties. To understand Maine's business, you have to dive into its investment portfolio, which can be separated into three major segments. First, 48% of the portfolio value is invested in underserved lower middle market or LMM. These are companies with revenue between 10 to $150 million and EBITDA between three to $20 million. So for them, Maine provides the convenience of a one-stop shop access to capital through first lien debt, senior secured debt, and equity financing. The pool of Maine's prime customer base is estimated to be about 175,000 LLM businesses, which are the most under
underserved in access to capital, and also there's generally less competition. As of end of 2020, this segment of Maine's portfolio works with 70 companies. Of those issued debt financing, 98% of them are at first lien positions and 65% are at fixed interest rates. The segment weighted average yield stands at 11.6%. On the equity side, it holds an average 38% ownership position in 99% of the companies and 60% of them pay dividends. The average investment size is $18.4 million at fair value, diversified across more than 26 industries with no single industry having a concentration greater than 9%. The geographic distribution by invested capital shows the highest concentration in the southeastern states at 30%, followed by the West at 24%. The second segment makes up 27% of the company's portfolio, and it consists of private loan investments that provide a recurring source of income to complement the LMM segment. This involves 62 investments with a fair value of $740 million and an average investment size of $12.2 million. This segment's average yield is 8.7% as of end of 2020, with 93% of them with floating interest rates. 93% of these private loans are secured debt and 95% of them are first lien debt. The third segment makes up 17% and this is the middle market investments that consists of 42 investments with a fair value of $446 million with an average investment size of 11.6 million. 92% of the middle market segment is secured debt, 92% is first lien term debt and the weighted average debt yield is 7.9%. So the purpose of this segment is to provide liquidity for Maine's future investments. So it kind of acts like a savings account. So putting it all together, Maine's total portfolio consists of 175 companies with a weighted average yield of 9.5% spread across 32 industries with no single industry making up more than 6% of the portfolio. The largest single company makes up only 2.7% of the portfolio's fair value. Considering the fact that currently the S&P 500 is heavily weighted towards the tech sector at more than 26%, with Apple alone making up more than 6% of the index, you could argue that Maine's portfolio is a better risk-adjusted investment than an S&P 500 index fund based on exposure and diversification. Another important takeaway from the weighted average portfolio yield is that you can compare that to the average BDC industry yield, which is typically between 13 to 15%. Maine's yield being lower than that indicates the BDC is of safer and higher quality compared to the industry average. So with this portfolio, how has Maine performed as a business? The company grew its investment income by 47.8% between 2015 through 2019, but more importantly, its distributable net investment income or DNII grew in lockstep and that is where the dividend payouts come from. If we look further back, Maine has grown its net investment income by 222% since 2007 and its portfolio by 212% both on a per share basis. Not surprisingly, 2020 saw a decline, but its portfolio still grew, so I expect Maine to continue growing its DNII moving forward. When you compare Maine to the broader market, here you can see that since 2007, when the company started publicly trading up until the end of 2020, assuming dividends were reinvested, its total returns beat its peer group by 141%, it beat the S&P 500 by 344%, and it beat the Russell 2000 by 380%. Maine currently pays a dividend of 7.25% based on a share price of $37 as of this recording. That includes the monthly and special dividends over the past 12 months, which comes out to $2.70 per share. And stock price is currently 19% lower than its pre-COVID peak back in February 2020. But back to its dividend, it should be assuring that Maine has continuously grown or maintained its payout for 14 years straight, and then it is up 86% since its IPO. And in terms of dividend safety, even though the past 12 months of dividends surpasses the total NII per share of $2.13, 2020 was an anomaly for almost any business. I think it's more important to recognize that given its average portfolio yield stands at 9.5%, that is more than enough to cover the dividend yield. So I'm confident Maine will recover and continue to reward its investors. One last thing I want to point out is NAV per share and why it's so crucial to see this increase for any BDC. NAV stands for net asset value, and it basically tells you how much tangible assets the BDC owns net of liabilities. As I mentioned before, 
BDCs have to pay out 90% of their income, which means they have to grow by taking on debt or issuing more shares, which can dilute the shares held by existing shareholders. Napper share tells you if the value of each share is rising over time. For main, you can see here that the overall trend has been increasing, which is a good sign. If this were declining or flat, that is a big red flag. The next company on the list is Gladstone Investment Corporation, ticker symbol GAIN. This is another BDC similar to Main Street in that it primarily targets lower middle market companies in the US, but it has some key differences. First, Glassstone is a much smaller company by net asset and market cap, ranking at number 21 by both measures. Based on net assets, it's about one-fourth the size of Main Street, and this is reflected in its portfolio as well, which is made up of just 28 companies that fit three loose categories, manufacturing, business services and distribution, and consumer products. And they are geographically dispersed across 17 states and 13 industries, altogether adding up to $622 million in total assets at fair value. 59% of the assets are secured firstly in debt, 17% are secured secondly in debt, and the remaining is made up of preferred and common equity positions. The second difference you need to know is that Glassstone is an externally managed BDC, while Maine is internally managed. Glassstone Investment Corporation pays a base management fee of 2% of assets to Glassstone Management Corporation and additional incentive fees for performance. You see, Glassstone Investment Corporation is part of a family of companies under the Glassstone name. It has an affiliate relationship with these other investment companies, and they're all managed by Glassstone Management Corporation. On the other hand, Main Street pays a base management fee of 1.3% to an internal management team that has a 5% ownership stake in the company based on shares outstanding. These fees ultimately come out of shareholder returns, so the question is, are Main Street investors better off than Gladstone investors? And the answer is not so simple. While Main Street investors may pay less in fees, Gladstone arguably benefits from its close ties to three other investment companies connected through its management team. That network effect may bring more business and expertise to Gladstone so that it can compete better as a smaller player in the BDC industry. So the key takeaway is the management fee and structure shouldn't be the only factor when comparing BDCs. Instead, we need to look at other measures. Let's first start with the dividend. Gladstone currently pays an all-inclusive trailing 12-month dividend of 92 cents, which comes out to a generous 7.6 7% dividend yield based on current share price of $12, which is higher than Main Street. However, is that yield sustainable? Well, just like Main Street, we can't just look at payout ratios because COVID decimated earnings for a lot of companies in 2020. It's just not representative of where the company stands. So instead, we look at the weighted average portfolio yield and it stands at 11.9% as of end of 2020. And it has been consistently around that level the past four quarters. That comes to about 1.5 times higher than the dividend yield. So I don't see Glassstone having any problems paying the dividend, but it is closer to the industry average of 13 to 15% compared to Main Street. So by this measure, Gladstone's portfolio is inherently more riskier. In terms of dividend growth, it has grown it at about 2% since 2016 and has never missed a dividend since its IPO in 2005. And that dividend growth is sufficiently supported by an average 4% growth in its investment portfolio over the same time period. The last thing we want to look at is the NAV per share. And here we can see that it has generally been trending upward. So Glass Glassstone has been rewarding its investors with a high dividend and modest capital appreciation since at least 2015. Moving away from BDCs, the next company is SL Green Realty, ticker symbol SLG. SLG is a fully integrated REIT focused on acquiring, managing, and maximizing the value of Manhattan commercial properties. As of the end of 2020, it is the largest owner of office real estate in New York City, holding interest in 88 buildings totaling 38.2 million square feet across the city. This includes ownership interest in 28.6 million square feet of prime Manhattan real estate and 8.7 million square feet securing debt and preferred equity investments, or DPE. You can see on this map that its largest ownership concentration is in the Midtown area south of Central Park in locations at close proximity to subways and transit hubs followed by its Midtown South locations, and then the downtown properties round out its ownership portfolio. Arguably, New York City was the epicenter of the COVID pandemic from the very beginning, and it is still not out of the woods yet. 
However, SL Green managed to survive the crisis thanks to its financial strength. It maintained and increased its dividend, managed to pay out a special dividend, took advantage of its lower share price to execute a massive buyback program, and I think it has positioned itself to thrive when the Manhattan market rebounds. In Q2 of 2020, SL Green rapidly executed what it called the $1 billion plan to increase its cash balance as a defensive measure. And you can see here how it managed to pull together a $1 billion consolidated cash balance by the end of June. Fast forward to the end of 2020, it boosted its revolving credit facility to $1.5 billion and drew down its cash and cash equivalents to first pay a special dividend of $1.70 per share, which comes out to a generous yield of 2.5% based on the share price at the time of the announcement. And remember, this doesn't even include the regular dividend. Speaking of which, also in that same December announcement, it increases regular dividend by 2.8% to $3.64 per share. This makes it the 10th straight increase and while the growth rate has been flattening, as you can see in this chart, it remains to be seen how fast the company and the city will rebound on the other side of this pandemic. Second, and more significantly, it boosted its stock buyback program by $500 million, bringing a total repurchase to $3.5 billion. And by repurchasing 32.4 million shares of common stock, its outstanding shares is expected to fall by more than 30% from the last few years, which is great news for existing shareholders. Because of the repurchase program, SL Green's FFO per share rose from $7 in 2019 to $7.10 in 2020, even though the FFO fell from $605 million to $562 million due to asset sales and the pandemic. And this decline was largely in line with management's initial guidance earlier in the year at $7.30 FFO per share. For 2021, FFO per share is expected to come in at $6.50, which is more than enough to cover the dividend. So with all that being said right now, SL Green's monthly dividend stands at 5.3% with a current stock price of about $69 per share, which is about 30% lower prior to COVID. So it's great that this company has taken good care of its shareholders this year but what about its underlying business? As the FFO would suggest, same-store rental revenue did decline year-over-year year by about 4%, and this was due to two specific reasons. First, lower operating expenses for tenants meant lower expense escalation revenue. And second, the company had to charge off unpaid rent. I don't think this is terribly concerning in light of the fact that, compared to the overall midtown Manhattan market, SLG has maintained an above-average occupancy rate looking back five years. And while overall asking rents in Manhattan declined by 0.3%, percent year over year class a property asking rent actually increased 0.5 percent so lease demand for the properties slg owns remains steady if we take a look at the largest tenants based on annualized cash rent share viacom credit suisse sony td bank along with a handful of large law firms are at the top of the list with lease expiration staggered throughout the next decade and beyond. And the makeup of SLG's tenants by industry closely resembles the Manhattan office market itself, with Tammy making up 36%, which stands for technology, advertising, media, and information companies, financial services making up 24%, and the legal industry making up 13%. The vast majority of these companies have thrived in the post-COVID economy, where social distancing isn't impacting their core businesses. While it's too early to say how many of the companies in these industries will keep their employees in a work-from-home arrangement indefinitely, many well-known names continue to make long-term commitments to prime real estate locations in New York City. Facebook, TikTok, AIG, and Amazon are just some of the companies signing long-term leases for sizable commercial space, which is a good sign for SLG. If you found this video helpful or useful in any way, be sure to hit that like button down below. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any new videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.